Hey guys, welcome back to Pop em Up Chem. In this video, we're going to do something a little bit different and we're going to try processing some calorimetry data using Excel. Really useful skill and we're going to also introduce a little bit of uncertainty calculations in there too. So the first thing we'll do is we'll look at how we collect the data to calculate enthalpy of combustion. But before we start that, here's a little question to practice your calculations. Pause the video and have a go. So remembering we're using Q equals MC delta T here, mass, we're gonna use one gram per centimeter or millimeter cubed for water and the specific heat capacity of 4.18 multiplied by T2 minus T1, which is gonna be 80, so we get 75,240 joules or 75.3 kilojoules per mole. And that's obviously if we take it to three significant figures. So before we get stuck into data analysis, we want to have a look at the enthalpy of combustion, firstly defining it and then the method of how to calculate it. So the enthalpy of combustion is the energy released when one mole of a substance is reacted completely with excess oxygen. So we can look at an example of that, of the combustion of methane. In any enthalpy of combustion equation, there's always going to be only one mole of the thing that we are combusting. Indeed, the standard enthalpy of combustion, that's what the little theta sign is after the delta HC sign, meaning it's done in standard conditions, is actually negative 800 and 91.8 plus or minus 1.1 kilojoules per mole. So what we're interested in is how we go about calculating this. Well, we'd set up our equipment a little bit like in this diagram. And the first thing we would do is we would take a lamp with the fuel that we want to find the enthalpy of combustion of. And then we would weigh it with the fuel inside it before we burn it and set it a known distance up underneath a copper can calorimeter with a known mass of water and a thermometer in. We also have these windshields on the side to try and reduce the amount of heat that is lost to the environment that is swept away from the reaction as it's occurring. Once we've got this system all set up, we would record the initial temperature of the water and the fuel is then burned for a known amount of time or until a set temperature change is reached. Then as this is occurring, at regular intervals of time, the temperature can be recorded so that we can produce a temperature over time graph. Now, we're going to note the maximum temperature that is reached, even if the temperature goes lower after, we're really interested in the maximum temperature. Then we wait for the lamp to cool, and then we weigh the lamp. Now we can also take the data that we've produced from the temperature and time measurements to produce a regression plot. And that would look something like this if we have our temperature on our y-axis and our time on our x-axis. Now what we can do is we can take a linear regression from the decreasing temperature to find a regression that will give us a theoretical maximum delta T change that will be slightly larger than if we just record the maximum temperature, which if we record the maximum temperature, it's going to be just here in this little blue star I've indicated. Now we're going to use data from the max temperature change or that blue star point in this data processing. However, all I would do is if I was using this experiment for an IA is I would have to explain how I could improve the experiment and where errors are coming from or preferably if you were doing this as an IA, you would actually produce those regression curves and be able to produce more accurate data. Now you may also be asked to use that regression plot technique in exam questions. So do watch out for that. 
Now, before we jump straight in, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to introduce or just update us on our absolute uncertainty and relative percentage uncertainties. These are gonna be things we revisit a lot in the course, so it's gonna be no harm to look at them here. Now, uncertainties occur due to limitations in taking measurements. With anything that we take measurements with, there is an associated uncertainty. For example, the measurement A is gonna have plus or minus delta A. So that could look something like 3.45 plus or minus 0.01 grams. So in this situation, delta A is what we call our absolute uncertainty. So 0.01 in this case. It's absolute because no matter what I measure with this instrument, my absolute uncertainty will always remain the same. However, that's not quite the whole story. That's where relative percentage uncertainty can help us understand how large that absolute uncertainty is in comparison to the measurement itself. And we use a simple calculation to work this out, where we take the absolute uncertainty, divide it by the measurement, and then multiply that value by 100 to give us the value in a percentage. Let's take an example measurement something like 12.25 plus or minus 0.02 centimeters cubed. In this situation, the absolute uncertainty is 0.02 and the measurement is 12.25. So we simply plug that into our equation for relative percentage uncertainty and we get 0.02 divided by 12.25 all multiplied by 100 which is 0.163, etc. percent. So around that to two significant figures is 0.16%. So when we're looking at processing data, here I've got some data from propanol, you'll see recorded the initial and final mass after there was a mass burned. And these were burned for five minutes. And then there was also the initial and final and temperature after that five minutes. You'll see here that the absolute uncertainty for the final, I've added the uncertainties of the two measurements before. So it's important that we understand that when we add or subtract those values, the absolute uncertainties are going to be added together. Now, when we multiply or divide values, we're going to need to convert those values into relative percentage uncertainties and combine the relative percentage uncertainty values. So we're going to, just as we could calculate the mass here, we're also going to calculate the initial temperature change and propagate that absolute uncertainty. However, it's gonna be a lot quicker and more efficient for us to do all of this process on Excel. So let's head over to Excel and have a look. So here you can see I've got my three tables, exactly the same as we had on the previous slide for our different alcohols. So I'm gonna highlight the different relative fields so we can see the yellow is initial, orange is final, and green is the combined difference in those. Before I carry on, I'm gonna make sure that the cells have the same number of decimal places as the absolute uncertainty that the measurements were taken in. You can do that by highlighting those relative cells. I'll do that for all of the tables and clicking format and then changing the cell type to number and changing the relevant number of decimal places. Then we can start calculating our differences in mass. So to do formulae on Excel, we're going to click equals and then click the cell we want to start with and then just click take away and then click the next cell and press enter to complete that formula. And you'll see it calculates that value for me. Now, if I go to the bottom right of that cell and drag across where I want those calculations to continue, it will continue that formula across each of those calculating the differences for me, which saves me a bit of time. And the more data we have, the more time we can save. 
So we can do the same here with our temperature change. We're going to do equals the final temperature, take away the initial temperature, T2 minus T1, and then drag that formula across to give me all of my values. And another fantastic thing about this is if you realize you've made a mistake, recorded something wrong, or you need to go back and repeat trials, because the formula takes the values from specific cells, if values change, the formula will automatically change the outcome for you. So you can take a few moments and fill in your other tables before we move on to the processing. So on the processing tab, I've tried to keep things as separate as possible to make it easy to illustrate. These tables on the left hand side are the raw data with all of those calculations complete and just copied over. And then at the top, we have our specific heat capacity and our mass of water. And I've already completed the calculations for the methanol. And now I'm going to go through the calculations for ethanol to show how we can process all of this data and allow us to find the enthalpy of combustion for each of these alcohols and see how the number of carbons in these alcohols affects their enthalpy of combustion. Firstly, I need to find the average. So the great thing is, is that Excel has the average function. If you type in equals and then AVE and click the average function, it's going to allow you to then just highlight the array that you want it to calculate. So in this case, the values we got for the mass burned, and then it gives me average value for that. We're going to do exactly the same process for my average temperature change. Use the average function, highlight the array and press enter. Nice and easy. So before we move on, let's put in our uncertainty and calculators our percentage uncertainty. So we had a 0.01 uncertainty for our mass. So that's going to be the absolute divided by the value all multiplied by 100, which gives us our percentage uncertainty. We can do exactly the same process for our average mass, put in our absolute same equation again so we can actually drag it down and it will do the same process in those cells. Now we can begin to calculate the value of Q which I've done in the table above. So Q equals MC delta T which is why I put the mass of water in its own cell so I can just click that multiplied also by the specific heat capacity of water multiplied by the temperature change which is the cell above now, don't forget that that temperature change is the change of temperature of the water. So we're going to need to multiply that by minus one to give us the value of the temperature change of the reaction. Now, you can remember from the slides previously, we said that when we multiply, we have to use the relative percentage uncertainty. So I'm going to combine the relative percentage uncertainty of the mass the specific heat capacity and of the temperature change and then convert that into the absolute uncertainty. So the way I convert that into the absolute uncertainty is simply by rearranging the formula for percentage uncertainty. So I take the percentage uncertainty, I divide that by 100 and multiply that whole component by the actual value, which gives me my absolute uncertainty. Similar process we can go through all of for working out our number of moles. Moles is of course mass divided by molecular mass. It's divided so I'm going to have to use the relative percentage uncertainty so I combine the relative percentage uncertainty of those two values and then do the relative percentage uncertainty divided by 100 and multiplied by the actual value, which gives me my absolute uncertainty for my number of moles. Now we know that delta H is Q over N. So to work out my enthalpy of combustion, I'm just quite simply going to take my energy change or Q, divide it by my number of moles, and that's going to give me my enthalpy of combustion. 
That value will, of course, be in joules. And I've put in this table that I want the value in kilojoules. So I'm going to do that function all over 1000 because then it gives me the answer in kilojoules. Now, I want to work out my absolute uncertainty for this value because that's going to be what I'm going to include on my graph in the next part. So again, we divided. So I'm going to add my two percentage uncertainties for my moles and for my energy change and then do my percentage uncertainty divided by 100 multiplied once again by the actual value, which will give me my absolute uncertainty for my enthalpy of combustion of ethanol. So I can repeat the exact same pattern for my propanol to get my enthalpy of combustion of propanol. And that allows me to fill in my little summary bottom table. Now, all of the values I've got for absolute uncertainty are given as negative values. So I'm just going to take the negative value of all of these because absolute uncertainty is quoted as plus or minus. These aren't necessarily negative uncertainties. So I'm just going to quickly put a negative in front of all of those to correct for that and then copy those absolute uncertainties down into my summary table and then we're going to move to a separate tab although you wouldn't have to to draw a graph we're just going to do it for clarity in this video so I'm going to take that data and move over to my next tab so the reason I've got the simplified data here is I have my independent variable in one column and my dependent variable in another column I'm going to come to insert go to a simple scatter and it will give me this very basic chart area and now we're going to format this area so that it's more useful and gives us more information so firstly i'm going to label the axis titles the x and y with quite simply the titles that are in the table i'm going to give units here now because the x-axis is only the number of carbon atoms in the molecule a number is its own unit so i don't need units there but it's still a pretty ugly graph these big grid lines don't really help the perspective so i'm also going to insert some grid lines i'm going to look at my minor horizontal and my major horizontal which makes the graph much more readable and it's just going to be generally easier to interpret I'm going to add a linear trend line and then I'm going to click on the trend line, double click on the trend line and make sure that I display my equation and my R squared value on the chart. So now it's definitely looking a little more pretty. However, I have noticed I've got the increments on the X axis showing there is 0.5 increments. However, the major value increments were one as in the number of carbons atoms in the primary alcohol so i'm going to click this axis and change my major units now we do want to make sure we include a chart title it doesn't matter too much for this but make sure you give a relevant title in any report you do so i suppose this is a graph detailing the number of carbon atoms in primary alcohols versus the enthalpy of combustion. The last thing we want to do is we want to add some error bars. So we're going to select the data and then we're going to add error bars. So depending on the data we selected, the error bars can come in many different formats when we click that auto fill option. We want to go to custom value and specify because we know the absolute uncertainty. So this means we're going to click both the positive and the negative value for our error bars corresponding to the absolute uncertainty in our table. Once we've done that, we're going to want to delete the horizontal component of our error bars and we're going to have a lovely graph that showcases our data with our absolute uncertainty as well. So this kind of graph puts us in the position to make statements about trends we're 
finding, although we've only got three points here, we would look for a minimum of five points in a good investigation. It also allows us to use the equation to the line to begin to make other statements and further analyze the trend that we're seeing. So have a go at doing the incomplete workbook yourself, as well as trying the questions from the practical workbook. These skills are really useful and really transferable, guys. Once again, thanks for joining me. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell icon. And as always, practice makes slightly better.